Uh, we're here with Adam Philippi, uh, investigator at the National Human Genome Research Institute, and uh, you're about to give an exciting presentation, aren't you? <laughs> Absolutely. Tell us what you're doing. So we're here at AGBT uh, to present our latest results uh, in a collaboration with Karen Niga at UC Santa Cruz, where we've done high coverage, ultra long sequencing on the CHM13 cell line, complete hydrodiplomal mole. Um, it's been used in past PAC yeah, biobenchmarking studies, um, synthetic diploid studies. It makes a nice test case because it's essentially haploid cell line. Um, so we've done that now to maybe 40x ultra-long coverage, and the goal of this project is to finish all the remaining gaps in the human genome using this type of data. Okay. And so the talk I'm giving here at AGBT is describing results on the human X chromosome and how the initial assembly of this from whole genome data was in three pieces, and with a little elbow grease, we've closed those three remaining gaps, including the centromere. Wow. And uh, corrected any of the errors that were in the initial de novo assembly, and have now what we think is a high quality telomere to telomere assembly of the human X chromosome for the first time in history. Wow, so that's, that's amazing. amazing. That's actually the first time anyone's assembled a human chromosome. Any human chromosome. All of the human chromosomes in the current human reference have gaps. In particular, the centromere is the most common gap in all of them. Yeah. But even beyond the centromere, there's a number of gene families, satellite arrays, uh, telomeric, subtelomeric regions, pericentromeric regions, segmental duplications that all cause issues. And there's on the order of a hundred known issues in the current human reference genome. Wow. And now with this new ultra-long read technology, where we can get megabase scale reads, we're able to confidently resolve those reads. So, so this relies on getting the ultra long reads. That's that's great because that's the subject of long read club. Yeah, we're here for. Uh, <laughs> you remember that's, you've got the t-shirt. That's awesome. Yeah. So, um, I mean, talk us through the technical challenges here. You know, yeah. in terms of, of getting sufficient, you're going to need sufficient coverage of, of the chromosome. In terms of getting getting long long fragments, what were the issues that you faced, and how did you overcome those? Yeah. So the first issue we were worried about would be the consensus accuracy of these nanopore reads, which we saw in our collaboration together on the NA12878 project, yeah. that the polishing tools at the signal level for nanopore data are still maturing, yeah. um, and we top out at around 99.9% .9 consensus accuracy, which as a result you end up with a fair number of the genes having frame shift errors in them and so on. Um, so we have decided to combine not just the ultra-long data, but we've also previously uh, Washington University St. Louis. Uh, and Evan Eichler at the University of Washington have sequenced the same cell line with PacBio a number of years ago. So we have over 120x coverage of the same cell line with PacBio. Oh, right. uh, we've collected 50x coverage of 10x genomics uh, on the cell line, and we have BioNano, their new DLS uh, direct label enzyme, okay. uh, built for this recently as well. Mm -hmm. So we're integrating all of that evidence. So you've got three different types of sequencing for uh, four and, and, well, and BioNano as well. Sure. Okay, so that's. So, so tell us about the relative contribution of these technologies. Do you find you need all of these to get a really good result on the X? Yeah, I think eventually we might not, but for the time being it's useful to have them all. So we start with the ultra-long reads to build contigs. Uh, we combine that with the PacBio data as well, which helps improve the consensus quality of those contigs. Um, but in the case of the X chromosome, it was a whole genome shotgun project, so we sequenced the whole cell line, the whole genome of that cell line, uh, but we focused primarily on the X. So the X came out of the assembler in three pieces broken near the centromere and near a segmental duplication on the long arm, uh, closer to the tumor. And so uh, in those cases, we need some supplementary evidence to help us do the reconstruction. And so the bio nano maps become helpful here. In a lot of these cases, they span and tell you the copy number of the gene family or the copy number of the satellite element. Um, and so in those cases, we can go back to the original nanopore data and identify where the assembler made a mistake and in some cases manually stitch that region back together and then revalidate. Okay. Um, and so having the BioNano data was helpful from that structural validation perspective. As I said earlier, um, because the nanopore data can also have a slightly higher error rate at the consensus level, some of the genes have some residual frame shift errors in them. And so then we bring the 10x data in, in this case, to polish mostly the coding regions of the sequence. Because the key bit of the Illumina reads is you can only use them to polish in the regions of the genome that you can confidently map them. And so the Illumina data isn't all that helpful for polishing a satellite array because it's very difficult to map the short Illumina reads to the right location in that array. 
Um, so here's where it's helpful to have both the PacBio and the Nanopore data to get the best reconstruction of the repeats that we can get, maybe up to 99.9 uh, consensus accuracy. And then in the unique regions where you have the coding sequence, we can bring in the 10x data and polish those to a you know, perfect level of accuracy. So, so okay, so talking about the, the, what about the sample preparation? Do you have any challenges with extraction, with getting enough material for sequencing, things like that? Yeah, the, the key in this project is that we required a lot of material. So we're using uh, the Loman and Quick Ultra long protocol that's up on the Protocols IO site. A classic. Basically gave that classic work to <laughs> our sequencing facility. They got up and running in not too long of a time. Okay. Um, and then it was just a matter of growing enough cells that we could get enough DNA because you know, the input to that protocol is 10, 15 micrograms of material. Yeah. So uh, this was almost the rate limiting step at this point, just growing enough cells. Um, in the CHM13 line is a bit of a slow grower as well. Okay. And so growing that. Uh, all summer long, so that we could keep up with the oh, wow. appetite and the sequencing machine was a bit of a challenge. And what sort of what sort of read lengths were you getting? Where did you top out at? On your so uh, the longest read length is just over a megabase for this. We don't quite hit the, the ultra ultra longs that yeah. sometimes that we see come out of your lab. But the read N50 is about 75, 80 kb, um, and. N50 is a bit of a tricky number because if you have higher throughput, you can always throw away the short reads and boost your N50 yep. stack. Yep. Yep. And so the key bit for these kind of signal duplications we're trying to resolve is reads over 100 kb. And if we just talk about coverage of the genome in reads greater than 100 kb, we're well over 10x coverage of a whole human genome with reads of that length. And that makes the assembly much easier. And so, so what is it about the X chromosome that's enabled you to resolve that thing? Do you need longer reads for everywhere else? Or it was... Um, mostly a, a matter of expertise that Karen Miga has, is a satellite expert and is also quite familiar with the X chromosome and so we had local expertise that we yeah. can rely on and, and tell us what the expectation is in some of these regions. Um, there's a number of other chromosomes that came out of the Genovo assembler in good shape that only have one or two gaps. Yeah, okay. So we'll take those next. Okay, great. So recently um, I, I, you, and, you and Sergey Corin did some interesting modeling looking at the impact of both read length and, and uh, read level accuracy yeah. on how, how well you can reconstruct assemblies and, and uh, I think you know that seemed to show there was this balance between read length and accuracy and obviously you get extremely accurate very long reads you've got a yeah. very good chance of reconstructing genomes uh, fully. Did you find that that modeling work was, was borne out by the CHM13 experiments? Yeah, we were quite happy that the figure that we have in the NA12878 paper suggested that we needed about 30x coverage of the ultralong protocol to exceed the current continuity of the human reference. That's what we've collected, and we exceed by order of maybe 10 megabase pair contig N50 size wow. compared to the current human reference. Okay. So what is the N50 of the current human reference, and what's the N50 of your new assembly? Uh, I think the current human reference is in the 50s, okay. low 60s, and the best assembly that we have so far, I think, is a 75 megabase pair wow. N50 contig size straight out of the assembly process. That's incredible. I think there's um, a less talked about effect of having a complete reference is that it reduces the bias of all of the downstream analyses. And so if you think about any of the read mapping, resequencing experiments that are mapping to a reference, all of the reads that came from the regions of the genome that haven't been sequenced yet need to map somewhere, and then they mismap. And this causes false SNPs. It makes uh, SNP calling more challenging just from Illumina-based sequencing. Okay. And so having all of those regions now finished attracts those reads that normally would be mismapped and cause and can you can you quantify that in terms of you know if you now go back and remap Illumina data sets uh, against the new assembly are you recruiting a large number of reads or are you getting more refined SNP calls or yeah we haven't precisely measured that yet with this new reference because we're still in the phases of polishing it um, but on the X chromosome in particular an experiment we plan to do is take the current human reference swap our X in for the current X and then run a read mapping experiment and quantify how much better the accuracy of that set calling than calling this okay so that's a complete reference. so that's a good reason to try and get these references but yeah that's that's the boring engineering reason to do it um, I think there are going to be genomic insights born out of this as well um, we had a project last year with some collaborators at NIH where we sequence more representative versions of the human RDNA repeat. And within there, we're finding variation that doesn't exist in the current human reference, um, and following up on the functional consequences of that as well. And so I think we don't really know what we don't know. And so by sequencing these regions, we'll find out. What do these centromeres, particularly a kind of, kind of so-called genomic dark matter, horrible mm -hmm. term, but you know, what, what do these centromeres, now, now you've got contiguous sequences, what do they, what do they look like? Or, 
really surprising about about their structure? Um, the thing that was surprising to me about a lot of these repeat arrays that we saw uh, evidence of for the RDNA repeats, and we're also seeing in the centromere, is that there is a fair number of SNPs. There's variation within these long repeat arrays, and I think it was probably a bit of an open question how homogenized these repeats are. Okay. There's a lot of recombination happening, there's a lot of gene conversion happening. Have they fully homogenized or is there unique variation in there? Okay. And this is key to being able to assemble them because if there is variation at some regular rate, you can use those small heterogeneities to tile across a repeat that might be longer than your read length. Yeah. And so it's not just back to your original point of the read length versus the accuracy. It's not just about the length of the reads, but if your reads are accurate enough, you can then use those micro heterogeneities to tile across repeats that might be longer than the read. And so we have seen evidence of that both in the centromeres and in the RDA. So sort of following on from that then, what do you think is the, the next step? Is it more uh, coverage? Is it longer reads? Is it higher accuracy? I guess all three. But which yeah. one would you push for at yeah. the moment? Well, we've been pushing uh, for long reads for the longest time. Uh, coverage and accuracy are also important. Um, any improvements to any of those three factors will improve your ability to assemble. Um, read length is the easiest. Okay, it's also the easiest to deal with when you're doing the assembly. So most of the assemblers that are built today and that you can run out of the box now rely very heavily on what's called spanning a repeat, having a read that's anchored yep. uniquely on either side. There are methods that can tease apart variation between segmental duplications or between haplotypes, those still are a little bit in development. And there's a lot of assembly groups working on that problem right now, but it'll be another few years until we have viable methods to do that yeah. in de novo assemblies, especially in these highly repetitive regions. Yeah. Yeah. And so read length is the easiest, so that's why we've been that's choosing to go with the ultra length protocol. So, uh, I mean, and following on from that, I know that the uh, PacBio at this meeting are going to be talking about um, the hi-fi uh, read idea, which is, is the much more accurate single molecule reads, yeah. maybe with the trade-off on the length that you're seeing. Uh, have you played with that data set? Uh, is, is, that, is that a good idea? Is that going to help with, with, with these particular types of assembly issues? Yeah, we have played with that data set. So they did the uh, Ashkenazi Sun um, from the pers uh, Personal Genome Project mm -hmm. samples. And we applied our trio binning method that we just published last fall that can use parental data to separate haplotypes prior to assembly, and we measured how well that works when you're using the hi-fi reads versus the original reads. Um, and the nice bit about the hi-fi reads is that you can use larger marker sequences. So when I'm talking about finding unique sequences within repeat arrays that can help you span them, when you're dealing with pack bio data and you're looking for those markers, there might be an error every 10 bases, and so you have to use a smaller camera size. With the hi-fi reads, you can get away using a larger marker sequence because more of the read is correct. And so in some of those repeats, it can help you identify where those micro-heterogeneities are to separate haplotypes or segmental duplications. Um, the downside of the hi-fi data is that it's kind of an old-school library preparation where you've got a normal distribution of read lengths around 10 or 15 kb. And so what you're missing is this long tail of the really long reads. So if there's SNPs between your haplotypes that are separated by more than 10 kb, yeah. you're losing now that linkage information yeah. that you would otherwise recover if you had 100 kb. Yeah. And so there's a trade-off to be had there, and I don't think we really know the answer yet if that's going to be a superior technique or not. Okay, so I mean, I guess something that would be interesting to 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 the, the viewers back home, it will be, okay, I, I'm interested in getting a chromosome scale assembly of my organism of interest, animal, plant, microbe, is there a is there a formula or a recipe that you can recommend uh, based on your experiences so far? Uh, I kind of feel like I know what you're going to say, but you know, <laughs> what what a what, what advice would you give yeah. for people wanting to kind of reproduce the kind of thing that you've done? Yeah, and well, the first answer is that every genome is unique, and so the repeat sizes, the repeat content, if it's a diploid, the heterogeneity, if it's polyploid, additional issues, all of this affects kind of your assembly strategy. If we're talking about human-like, well-behaved vertebrate genomes, uh, and you're willing to spend time required to generate these ultra-long reads, this is the way, the only way so far we've been able to get from telomere to telomere is the combination of ultra-long nanopore data, PacBio, 10x, BioNano. Okay. This is 
what I used to call the kitchen sink approach. Yeah, right. Or the gold toilet approach, right? It's overkill. We don't need everyone to have a gold toilet. Approach. Yeah. But we're doing it in this case because we're trying to finish the human reference genome. Which yeah. It's worthy of such time and effort. Yeah. Um, if we're now talking about pangenomics and we want to do many human genomes, then I think it's okay to say combine only nanopore with 10x or only pac bio. Yeah. And then it comes to a cost and a throughput. What kind of cost are we looking at here then? For, for doing this kind of assembly, you uh, yeah. four different technologies, yeah. high coverage. Yeah. Um, I mean, I including the labor costs as well. You yeah. know, how, how much are we looking at for doing something like this now? So, um, I'm also part of this vertebrate genomes project, which is doing a similar recipe on all of the vertebrate taxonomic orders. Mm -hmm. And so, this is you know on the order of 260 whole genomes that we're attempting to assemble. All four technologies. The current price target for uh, say a two gig vertebrate genome is about twenty thousand dollars. Okay. Um, so it's much cheaper compared to even a few years ago the amount of money that we would spend on genome projects, but everybody wants to push to the thousand dollar genome. Mm -hmm. And there I think so far I've only seen things like the Promethion offering the amount of throughput and cost that you could do that at scale for that price point. Okay. And the numbers get better every year, mm -hmm. as we know, both in terms of accuracy and throughput for all of the platforms. Yeah. And so the numbers will keep coming down. Um, yeah. So let's say you haven't got twenty thousand dollars, but you want to get the best possible uh, genome within some kind of you know reasonable envelope, you know, a few thousand dollars. Yeah. Well, what's your kind of what's your kind of reference genome on a budget recipe? Would you say <laughs> reference genome on a budget? Um, I think if you really needed to cut costs, it would be a Promethean flow cell with ten x data. Okay, interesting. Because the Promethean flow cells are two thousand dollars ballpark, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, that gives you enough coverage, 30x coverage, for a human genome from one flow cell. Uh, we had a mouse genome we recently put on one Promethean flow cell, got 120 gig of throughput, and got a de novo assembly to answer the question that we were trying to answer. Okay. But the gene accuracy is still going to be low, and so then you need to add something like 10 inch. I think there's a huge room for improvement in the combination of those two technologies, just on the algorithm development side, yeah. to develop better polishers that can benefit from the accuracy of the 10x data but benefit from the structural accuracy of the data point. So yeah, that'll it be makes an interesting sense. Yeah, interesting. Interesting. So, you know, we've been talking about remake, but, but how long is too long? How long? No. <laughs> the answer is nothing is too long. <laughs> if you can sequence a chromosome from end to end, I'll happily take it. So do you think we can get there? That's not for me to answer. <laughs> okay, that's but I'll happily right. hang up my assembly hat when that happens. Oh, fantastic. Okay. Uh, and then work on... Is, is that this This hat? is my assembly hat. <laughs> well, that's a great place to end it, I think. There you go. Yeah. Thank you very much for yeah, your time, Thanks Adam. for inducting me into the long Yeah, yeah. Well, You're very I welcome. I put in my time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also, I think I was looking forward to your presentation. Yeah, yeah. thank you. All right. That's great. Good. Maybe a trip to the pool first. Huh? Yeah, should we go to the pool? Yeah, yeah, yeah let's cheers. Let's, <laughs> let's go to the pool, right? <laughs> because I think about gold toilets. <laughs> 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 nothing, nothing beats gold toilets. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs>